Good evening. On behalf of Belmont Against Racism and you, you the vote of First Church in Belmont, I welcome you to tonight's program on redistricting and voting rights, the road to an inclusive democracy. We are thankful to the Belmont Media Center for their always able assistance and for airing this program in Belmont. I'm Catherine Bonfilio, board member of Belmont Against Racism. We believe the right to vote is at the heart of our democracy. Barr and UU The Vote have worked in partnership with Reclaim Our Vote since 2020, sending over 6,000 postcards, as well as phone banking to encourage people to register to vote and to encourage voting. We have also supported voting rights initiatives here in the Commonwealth. You will learn how you can join in this effort at the end of this program. We will also post the contact information for the panelists organizations on the Belmont Against Racism webpage. We are very excited to hear from tonight's distinguished panelists. To assist us, we have invited Professor David King, who has kindly agreed to moderate tonight's panel discussion. David King joined the Harvard faculty in 1992 and chairs Harvard's bipartisan program for newly elected members of the US Congress. He also chairs Harvard's program for senior executives in state and local government. In the wake of the 2000 presidential elections, Professor King directed the Task Force on Election Administration for the National Commission on Election Reform, chaired by former presidents Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter. That effort culminated in the landmark Help America Vote Act. Author, co-author, and co-editor of three books, he advises election-related nonprofits and is board chair for the pro-democracy group Citizen Power Initiatives for China. Uh, Professor King, it is an honor to have you with us tonight. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, let's get to a share screen of my own. And it, the first slide here that you should be seeing uh, just has a couple of links to it as well for Belmont Against Racism. We've met Catherine Bonfilio from there and you, you, the vote from the, from the First Church uh, Unitarian Universalist and Priscilla Cobb will be joining us uh, at the end um, and also helping out with the Q&A. So the panelists you will be introduced to in just a moment, Andrea Miller, Senator Will Brownsberger and Tanisha Sullivan. And here's the order of things. Um, there'll be a welcome from Senator Brownsberger. I'll introduce the panel and topic. Andrea Mill is gonna set the stage nationally for us. Tanisha Sullivan's gonna tell us about some of the challenges in Massachusetts. And Senator Brownsberger will discuss redistricting and representation. It's obviously a big news day in DC around voting rights and reform, um, but it feels like it's a big news day almost every day around voting rights and reform. Very much things are in the balance. We have uh, wonderful guests, but the best guests of all are those of you who are watching and want to participate. We will be done with most of our talking at eight o'clock and have a half hour of Q&A from you all. And you'll see that there's a function um, there in the webinar where you can ask questions, wait until eight o'clock, then type them in. Priscilla and Catherine will help us wade through those. So we begin with Senator Brownsberger. Uh, Senator Brownsberger says, welcome. Uh, welcome, welcome to everybody. And uh, let's get on with the program because uh, I'm looking forward to getting to the Q&A and I don't wanna hold us up any further than that. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to the Q&A as well. Um, I'll make sure that I'm sharing this appropriately. I'm gonna introduce the panel. Senator Brownsberger, you know, I, we've known here, everyone's known Senator Brownsberger for a very long time. And for us, he is a big deal. I remember when he was first running for selectman, he's been a real champion at every level. Before he was a selectman, he worked at Harvard in various capacities. He was also assistant attorney general. He's represented um, parts of two counties, both Suffolk and Middlesex. Um, most importantly, he's, like the voice of criminal justice reform and ran the process for redistricting in the state of Massachusetts. Um, he's been in the crossfire for that, the crosshairs for that, uh, but incredibly thoughtful. And it's a great honor for, uh, for us to be able to spend time with you, Senator Brownsberger. Uh, 
Andrea Miller also has just a remarkable, wonderful background. Uh, she's an expert in voting rights and climate, the Equal Rights Amendment. She was a founding board member for um, Center for Common Ground. I encourage you to pay attention to their website. She's used technology uh, to lead this wildly successful Reclaim Our Vote project, which was so uh, embraced here uh, at, uh, in Belmont as we sent these out. She also has a background in um, working in Congress. And Tanisha Sullivan is a very familiar face to everybody in Boston, president of the Boston branch, the NAACP. She's from Massachusetts, went to Boston College. Uh, she was a chief equity officer for the Boston Public Schools. She's worked as an attorney um, working on economic justice project, lawyers committee for civil rights. And um, she worked with Marty Walsh on a commission studying police guidelines. And we'll be here again tonight to tell us about um, voting rights and procedures in Massachusetts. So let's begin with Andrea Miller. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for that incredibly gracious introduction and welcome. And I want to thank our wonderful host and sponsors. One of the things that is going to be new in 2022 for Center for Common Ground, and I love your racial justice focus, is that we will be convening a faith table literally inside Center for Common Ground. And one of our board members, Reverend Rodney Sadler, has an initiative, Reimagining Race in America, uh, the conversation that is long overdue. And we want to be able to work with our partners who have worked with us so much on democracy to join us and assist in helping with those conversations that are just so long overdue in America. And what we're seeing is what had been a wound has now really begun to fester. And we are seeing that in, uh, well, we really saw it in January 6th, 2021. And then we are literally seeing it in the way that we are beginning to interact with each other across racial lines. A lot of it has been there for decades. So I will be reaching out and having that conversation. Anyway, um, as was said, my name is Andrea Miller, and I work on voting rights with 44,000 volunteers. We are partnered nationally with the Religious Action Center on Reform Judaism. We also have worked literally since 2019 with You, You, The Vote. So we love you. Thank you all so very much. Uh, we have added United Church of Christ. They're now working with us at a national level. And we work with the worker circle. And we are also working with uh, the American Ethical Union. Anyway, the state of voting in the United States. If you didn't already know it, you know it now that democracy is a very, very, very delicate ideal. And right now it is really, really, really being strained. In 2020, we worked in nine states, Alabama, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas, and we did a little bit of work in Virginia. In 2020, for that election, our wonderful volunteers allowed us to send 9.4 million postcards to voters in the states where we work. We made 1.9 million phone calls, and we sent 2.9 million text messages. What were we talking to voters about? 
we were letting voters know who were formerly registered, who had been removed from the rolls. We were letting them know that they had been removed from the rolls and basically they had lost their, and notice I'm going to say ability to vote and not right because if voting was right, then it wouldn't be so easy for you to lose it. They'd lost their ability to vote. And we wanted to let them know that that had happened and also tell them how they could get it back. We also worked with voters asking them to pledge to vote and take friends and family members with them. And then for our states that had early voting, we really worked hard to make certain that people understood that they were not going to need to wait until election day, that there were so many more places in many of our larger localities where they could vote during early voting. But we also made sure they knew where early voting happened to be located. So one of the big problems that we're having right now with elections is is if you are an older voter or a rural voter and you don't have internet and or you don't have a computer, early voting locations and early voting information is really only on the internet. So unless you have a certain level of technical ability or have friends and family members who are willing to help you with that, you just don't get the information. And then the other thing that we saw was people didn't have a means to go and vote because in so many instances on election day, polling locations had been moved. They were no longer at a location where people could easily access them through public transportation, or in the case of early voting, normally it's at the registrar's office, and who knows where that is. So we really had an opportunity to see firsthand what the challenges are to older, poor voters, and these are the voters who are going to be the most impacted by the voter suppression tactics. So after that little runoff election in January 4th, 2021, the Georgia legislature went into session. And when they went into session, we literally saw an onslaught of legislation seeking to make it harder for people to vote. The number one goal of the Georgia election, um, I forget what they called themselves, commission. They were something about the election security commission. Their number one goal was to end no excuse absentee voting. That was by mail and in person because we were tipped off to what they were doing and we followed them bill by bill and every bad bill they introduced. We went to voters who had told us their voting plan was to vote by mail. If they were in the district of one of those legislators that was introducing this bad legislation, and there were more than 40 bills. We simply called up the voters that we had told how to vote by mail and said, did you know that your state senator, your state delegate is trying to make it impossible for you to vote by mail? And people were like, what? Would you like to tell them what you think of that? Well, I certainly would. Hang on, we're going to patch you through. So the national and federal legislation that everybody is hearing so much about is really designed to do two things. There's two really critical bills. The For the People Act, which was renamed in the Senate, the Freedom to Vote Act, will be able to overturn this state 
of bad laws that got passed in various state legislatures. Now, an interesting point of good news, a lot of the bad legislation they passed in Arizona because they passed it during the budget session, the courts came back and said, no, these aren't laws. You can't pass stuff like this during your budget session. This does not have anything to do with the budget. So they're going to have to go back and pass all that bad legislation again. But we saw bills like they're attempting to end no excuse absentee voting. We saw Georgia substantially shorten the length of time between a general election and a runoff election, with the idea being making it hard to remobilize people to get them to go out and vote again. There were just so many bad bills. We defeated all of them with the exception of one, SB202, where they even wrote in the bill, if people are standing in line waiting to vote, it is illegal to give them food or water. You're trying to buy their vote. I'm trying to buy their vote with a bottle of water. Right. So again, um, we really worked with Georgia on their municipal elections in 2021. Something you will not hear about is that in many localities out in the countryside, out in the Georgia Black Belt, we actually won 48 municipal elections in Georgia with SB 202 rules in full force. Now, why do I say democracy is very, very delicate? We had another little election in 2021. We had a statewide election in our entire House of Delegates in the great state of Virginia. In January, Virginia had introduced some of the most expansive voting laws. And in December, with the loss of the statewide offices and the Virginia House, we saw exactly the same type of bills that we saw in Georgia in 2021. Bills to end no excuse absentee voting, bills to remove and prohibit drop boxes, bills to force us to reinstate photo ID. Virginia expanded early voting so that we had 45 days of early voting, and they're trying to reduce that to 14 days of early voting. In other words, all of our wins electorally um, and for voting rights were trying to be overturned. The other bill that we're working on nationally, and I know today in the House, they stuck both bills together and sent them to the Senate as an amendment so they could immediately begin the debate, is the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act uh, has to be reauthorized every 25 years. And the first time in history, this bill has not been reauthorized. So this bill would prevent states who previously had a history of voter suppression of being able to introduce bad legislation like what we're seeing coming out of the state houses. So the first bill, freedom to vote, overturns the bad legislation and sets a floor or a standard for what elections look like. Everybody can vote by mail. All states will have um, 15 days of early voting and all states will have online voter registration. So it sets a floor and the big one, all states will now have restoration of rights. And as I said, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, if your state has a history of discrimination, if you want 
they introduced laws that are going to change the way people vote. The Justice Department is going to have to pre-clear your ability to introduce that legislation. So thank you very much for giving me time to go through that. And I'm going to be able to be around for a while. So I'll definitely at least be able to hear all the other speakers. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that, that view, especially of the bills that have gone from the House side over to the Senate side. And the politics now comes down to the circumstances of possible, um, possibly getting it to the floor. Um, the, the House pulled a very interesting maneuver. They did something called an A not A, which is they, they tried to change the law on an authorization bill, um, on an appropriations bill. So that they, they generally, they broke their own rule to actually get it across. And now we have to see if, the, if uh, there will be those extra two votes to be able to waive the filibuster provision for this very narrow range just on voting rights. Kirsten Sinema this afternoon came out and said she's not willing to do that. So it's going to be a very tough poll going forward. Every one of the states though is facing um, some headwinds, some strong headwinds. And in the 18 months when I was working on the commission after the election in 2000, and I went around the country, it was very quickly made obvious that most people in the states view the, um, the, the actual mechanics of election is a very local or state issue. Um, the Help America Vote Act was designed to, to nudge things in, the, uh, in a correct direction, in a better direction. But we've seen a, um, it's been difficult to get that fully enforced, been eroded left and right. And every state is on its heels right now, including a state like Massachusetts, which is um, would be or should be on the vanguard of many of our voting rights legislation. Uh, so we want to hear from Tanisha Sullivan, a great lawyer, attorney, and the head of NAACP in Boston. The floor is yours, Tanisha. Thank you, uh, David, and I certainly want to take the opportunity to thank our hosts uh, this evening uh, for convening this very timely uh, discussion. You know, we, we began talking about this discussion several months ago, um, and, but who would know that we would be having this conversation um, as our nation is in the active debate um, in Congress uh, around uh, voting rights and access. Um, the NAACP is the oldest civil rights organization uh, in the country with a uh, articulated focus on uh, the elimination of racial discrimination and the advancement of racial justice. Here in uh, Massachusetts, we're very proud uh, that the Boston branch of the NAACP is the first chartered branch of the association. Um, and so in that, um, we have a very storied uh, history and legacy within the association and, and many of the policies that have been advanced uh, at the national level have found their roots uh, here uh, in the greater Boston area. And that's something that I like to share with folks because that's our shared history, our shared legacy here uh, in Massachusetts that we can all be proud of. I need to say that there is no greater issue uh, facing our country today than the fight for our full democracy. The issues that we're seeing, uh, certainly at the federal level, but more acutely at the state level, um, really highlight just how fragile our democracy is. Uh, it is a stark reminder of just how young we are uh, as a democracy and how much work we still have to do to fulfill the promise um, of the founding of this country, the principles of this country, freedom, justice, and equality for all people. Uh, the, the fight for uh, access to the voting, uh, to, 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 to the ballot box, um, really is a racial justice issue. And I think it's important for us to understand, you, and I'm sure you've heard this time and time again, um, and some may say, well, how could it possibly be a racial justice issue? It applies to everybody. Um, I think it's important for us to understand the history 
of voting access in this country and how this issue has been used historically to exclude um, all people from being able to fully participate in our democracy. When we think about um, post-Civil uh, War, what we saw um, uh, immediately coming out of the Civil War, quite frankly, was an increase in uh, participation in government by Black folks. Um, but what we also saw in response to that um, were efforts to suppress um, and limit access to the ballot box. And so, of course, that led to uh, the passage ultimately of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, which um, gave, which solidified within our Constitution the right to vote for black men. We know that women did not receive the right to vote until 1920. Um, but the point here is that, that I want to make sure that we understand, and you know, from, from, a, from a level setting standpoint, is that following certainly the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, what we saw systematically um, and very intentionally were policies and practices put in place at the state and local levels that were designed to limit access to the ballot for black folks, okay? So you see polling taxes, certainly intimidation, an increase in, in lynching, um, very violent um, actions that were meant to keep people from casting their ballot. Why? Because there's an understanding in this country that when our democracy is fully functioning, when all citizens who have the right to vote actually are able to exercise that right, it brings about greater participation, it brings about greater representation, it brings about greater voice and inclusion. It brings about more shared power. And so there were, have been, have always been, uh, attempts to, um, to block access and those efforts um, began in many respects um, in response to the increase, um, the desire and the increase in um, black folks actually going, going to the ballot box to cast their vote, to be able to fully participate in our democracy. What's important to note is that our constitution, though, uh, does give the power to our states and when it comes to time, place, and manner of elections. And that's why we're seeing kind of, um, why we're seeing both efforts at the federal level um, to bring about um, uh, voting, uh, electoral reform and to address the issues relative to voting rights, but it's also why we're seeing so much activity and, and some might argue unfettered activity at the state level, um, most of which has been designed in recent years to suppress um, uh, to suppress access to the, to, to the ballot, okay? What is important for us, I think, to be mindful in, in this moment of is that while we are all watching, well, I'll say most of us are watching, uh, deeply concerned with what we're seeing at the federal level as it relates to the slow pace at which uh, voting rights, the issue of voting rights is advancing through Congress um, for many reasons, and I hope we'll get to that in the Q&A. What's important to note is that there is a very important role that the states have to play. There's a very, there's very important power that the states have in this moment to take action. And so while we are seeing and what we're hearing mostly about um, across the country on these issues is relates to the suppression efforts at the state level, where I believe there is opportunity um, is for us to um, see more activity in those states, um, in those states where there is, I think, a, a belief in greater inclusion, belief in the power of greater representation, to be more intentional about advancing legislation meant to expand access to the ballot box. Okay. So with that, I do want to talk about what we've seen here in Massachusetts over the years, 
Okay. What we've seen, certainly 2014, 2018, we have seen some advancements with respect to expanding access to the ballot box. We've seen um, you know, attempts to break down barriers to voting. Um, so for example, um, thinking about um, uh, early voting uh, opportunities, um, thinking about online voter registration, um, pre-registration for 17-year-olds who will be 18 by the time we get to an election, um, uh, automatic voter registration, uh, participation in ERIC. These, these, um, mm -hmm. these policies um, that were enacted into law by, by Governor Patrick um, and Governor Baker all have sought to expand access to the ballot box. Um, but I have to say, um, we still have work to do. Um, and advocates have really been pressing for um, greater advancement here in Massachusetts as it relates to voting rights and access to the ballot box. Okay, so where, where, what more work do we have to do? There are, I'm not going to um, cite specific, um, well, actually, I won't say that I'm not going to do it because I might end up doing it at some point. Um, but what I want to say is that um, certainly our legislature, um, we saw in 2020, um, took um, very swift action um, to address the public health concerns um, that co the COVID-19 pandemic presented with presented to us as it related to access to the ballot box. And so we saw um, our legislature act to um, put in place temporary emergency measure measures um, related to mail-in balloting, uh, related to um, extended early voting um, opportunities um, in our municipalities, um, for example, right? But those were all temporary uh, and expired in December. Um, what, what is still left to uh, confront, what is still left to advance, um, includes mail-in balloting. So here in Massachusetts, we do not have um, no fault um, uh, absentee balloting, right? And so we still have mail-in balloting as an opportunity for us, which would basically say, look, you can vote by mail, or you can show up you know, at your polling location. It is your choice. So making mail-in balloting permanent, for example. Um, extending early voting opportunities. Here in Massachusetts, um, we do not um, have the opportunity to early vote in every election, okay, for example. So extending early voting opportunities. I think it's important to note that in 2020, during the, um, uh, the height of the pandemic, with those temporary uh, emergency measures that I, that I made reference to, we actually saw an increase in voter participation, um, arguably because we made it easier to vote. We broke down barriers to voting, okay? Um, so mail-in balloting, uh, extending opportunities for early voting, ensuring that folks who are incarcerated, who have the right to vote, actually um, have the structures um, around them to be able to cast their ballot. So in Massachusetts, certain incarcerated individual, individuals actually have the right to vote, but our system is not set up um, to um, allow for the easy access to the ballot, um, to the e for the easy access to the ballot. Of course, um, in um, the earlier, some of the earlier um, uh, reforms that were passed here in Massachusetts, um, we agreed to uh, um, participate in, um, in a national, in ERIC, which is a national database that is designed to help with um, voter registration verification. Um, so in a sense, it is designed to help ensure safe and secure elections, okay? What has happened though, in the years following the enactment of that law, is that we have not um, fully implemented or operationalized um, our participation in ERIC. And so what we, you know, so still unfinished business here um, is to ensure that we are actually participating in, um, in ERIC. Why does that matter? That matters um, because what we know, particularly in 2022, 
is that we are becoming an increasingly more transient society, people moving from place to place. We also know, particularly here in Massachusetts, the increase in housing for fragility, right? Which has led to, you know, people, you know, um, people perhaps involuntarily um, moving from place to place. We also know that for young people, younger people, um, you know, uh, having the ability um, as they're coming here, for example, to go to school, um, the changes in their address, for example. Um, these are all um, the issues that have our participation in ERIC could help to address to ensure that um, as someone is moving from place to place for whatever reason, their voter registration can follow them more easily. Okay, and then the last piece um, that I will that I will lift up at this point would be same day voter registration. We are the only state within New England that does not have some form of same day voter registration. Okay. We have veg registration deadlines. Anytime you have a deadline, there is a barrier. Okay. Same day voter registration would allow for anyone who is entitled to vote to wake up on any morning up to their election day, register and be able to fully participate in our democracy. Okay. And so um, when we think about mail-in balloting, early voting, um, ensuring that the structures are in place for those who are incarcerated to vote, um, thinking about full participation in ERIC, um, and advancing same-day voter registration, for example. Um, these are all policies that if we were to advance here in Massachusetts, could help to um, increase the par participation in our democracy. And so what I, I'm going to wrap on this point, many of us, again, um, are deeply concerned with what we're seeing nationally on the issue of voting rights and access, rightfully so. But we cannot allow the issue of what's happening at the federal level or the voter suppression efforts that are happening in states across our country keep us from Massachusetts from being reflective about the work that we have to do and about the things that we could be doing to ensure free and fair access to the ballot box. Um, for the NAACP, there is no greater issue. For the NAACP, there is no greater issue in this fight for racial justice than ensuring voting rights and access. Um, and that's not just for the federal level, but it is absolutely across our states and certainly here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thank you very much, Tanisha Sullivan. Um, a good review and a good charge. And I, uh, it's absolutely right that there are things that we can do at a very local level as well um, in, in terms of trying to make sure that there's access to the polling locations. For those of you who have not yet worked at a polling, polling place, um, get involved. It's quite remarkable. Um, Senator Brownsberger, you have obviously a large fan club. And I happen to know that Jean Mooney is here. And she's the chief of your fan club. There are other people who we all know well um, who are looking forward to hearing from you. Dorothy Stoneman, Eloise McGaw is here. But the scary part about having Eloise McGaw online with us is that Nostradamus himself is probably listening in as well. <laughs> Bob knows so much. And he probably knows how all this is going to work out. Laura Caputo is here, also part of UU you, The Vote. Uh, Louise Bray, the great and good Martha Moore is with us. Uh, so many. It's nice to see Nancy Davis, all of these friends of ours uh, waiting now to hear 
you put this in perspective because, well, we've known you for so long and now to see you helping to right some wrongs and set the stage across the state, not just with racial justice and policing, but the importance of getting um, our voting districts set up in ways that lead to better representation and more justice. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for, for your generous moderation of uh, kindness to all of us. Uh, I want to say uh, just salute uh, Andrea's work uh, on the front lines in a tough place. I'm, I'm honored to be in the same Zoom with her. And, and I also want to salute uh, Tanisha's work here in Boston because her advocacy has been uh, incredibly effective across a broad range of issues, um, including this issue, this central issue. The good news is that she's so effective that we've already voted for all of these things. Uh, we've already voted. Uh, you know, we, the Senate on October 6th passed a bill which includes vote by mail, early voting, uh, jail voting, membership in ERIC, uh, same-day registration, all the five that you mentioned, and uh, the um, some additional things to make it uh, easier to, to work this at the clerk's level, and um, some, some things to help uh, people who are disabled um, uh, vote better. So, so we are in the Senate, have gotten Tanisha's message, uh, and uh, have carried it across to actually pass legislation uh, to do all that, truly. And the how the even better news is that the House has also done that. Um, and the the only difference, the only real difference between the House and the Senate bill, or the big difference, I'm sure there's other differences, is uh, is the same day. We did the same day registration. The House has, has had some reservations about that. But the the great the lion's share of what's there, um, I think both branches agree to, and it it will get done. It will get done. It will get done in this legislation. Um, and it's, it's, it's right at the top of, um, I think, everybody's list. You can't go too long because, you know, we, we, what, what, what prompted us to move forward with all of that was the COVID situation. Um, the COVID situation, unfortunately, continues and uh, likely will continue through the spring or at least be in some form present through the spring. Omicron is dropping, uh, but, um, you know, it won't be gone. And so we want, we're going to want people to have those options that were both uh, access options and justice options, uh, but also public health options. And so we, I, I really think we're going to have a, uh, an awful lot of pressure on us, which I hope will be sufficient to cause us to get this done uh, in time for the municipal elections in the spring. So that's not too far away. So I, I think that uh, all of us will be able to celebrate that together. Um, the topic of my main conversation now will be um, the issue of redistricting. Uh, now, I, I had really no idea uh, what this thing, issue was about, um, or I, I knew what it was about, but I, I, I'd been on the receiving end of it uh, uh, 10 years ago. I'd experienced it, uh, but I, I didn't understand the richness of it. And it, it is a very deep and important issue and, and one that um, I just learned so much uh, going through um, First of all, it taught me a lot about the state, but it also taught me a lot about our Constitution. Uh, and, and I want to spend a, a couple of minutes talking about the fundamental constitutional principles that are involved in redistricting. Before I do that, let me just remind everybody what redistricting is. Uh, redistrict, redistricting is moving the lines around. And of course, we do local redistricting districting with precincts. We draw districts for senators, state senators. We draw, draw districts for state representatives, and we draw districts for um, Congress people. Massachusetts, the congressional redistricting is not too controversial because it's pretty much mathematically impossible to draw a Republican district in Massachusetts. So there's we we look we look like we're great um, great negotiators and we avoid lawsuits because, but the truth is we don't have lawsuits in Massachusetts because it's not worth it for the Republicans to sue us because there's no way they could, there's nothing they could really do to, to gain a seat here. Uh, so we, 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 congressional is the least controversial of, of all the, uh, well, in principle, it's the least controversial of, of the, uh, of the, of the pieces we do. We do it every 10 years. Our constitution requires, Massachusetts constitution Massachusetts Constitution requires us to do it every 10 years after the federal census is complete. So five big ideas in the Constitution. Two there at the beginning. 
Number one, we're a democracy. So it's about voting. It's the government of the people, by the people, for the people. We elect people. And, re- and districts is the foundation of representational democracy. Uh, two, and this isn't as much directly in play in the redistricting thing, but the other really big idea at, in the Constitution was we're not we're much more than a democracy. We are also a republic governed by laws. We have an independent judiciary, and the majority cannot just arbitrarily take away the rights of an individual. They can only do it through due process of law. This is not mob rule. It's much better than that. It is it is rule of law, democratic rule of law. That was there at the beginning. Then we had to fight the Civil War to bring us up to the next level, or at least bring us up to the next level in principle. We had to do another 100 years of struggle uh, into the 60s to really uh, bring um, African Americans uh, up uh, into their rights more fully. But in the Civil War, which was really started to preserve the democracy, the, the principle number one, but became a war to end slavery, um, and so that was one of the three, the third principle that we accomplished. Um, but the, the thing that pertains most directly to the redistricting process is the idea of equal protection under the law. Equal protection under the law. So that that's not about the individual rights of people, right? I mean, we 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 that was part of the Civil War too, was that the state, you know, that all the African Americans, all the freed slaves were citizens, and they and no state could abridge the right their rights as citizens. But those are individual rights. The Equal Protection Clause was that said that you your laws have to protect everybody equally. So that is the that's the principle that's at the heart of redistricting, and it's most foundational uh, around the idea that every district has to be the same size. If you go back to before the um, Civil Rights Movement and the Voting Rights Act in the mid 60s and the con- constitutional uh, decisions, uh, Supreme Court decisions that were made at that time, there were many Southern states, and I, you know what? There were probably some Northern states uh, that um, didn't have equal size district that favored one class of, of voters over another by giving them smaller districts. In other words, if you're 20,000 people in some gigantic rural county, um, get the same, you know, get one state senator, and then your 100,000 people packed into some city neighborhood also get one state senator, well, that's not fair. Uh, and so that that basic idea um, was established as a constitutional principle in the 60s. And from here, from then on, that has been the basis of the redistricting process. We have we have to work to draw equally sized districts. Um, the um, and and so that we have a little bit of flexibility. The law gives us some some recognition that there are you know boundaries that make it hard to make things exactly equal. So we have to in the state redistricting process. And by the way, this the town reprecincting process. We have to draw districts that are plus or minus five percent from the ideal size. So in other words, if you have 7 million people, 40 state senators, you divide 7 million by 40, you get 175,000, that's the ideal size. And you could be plus or minus 5% of that, which is you know plus or minus 8,000 voters or so. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the foundational equal protection principle. But then there's another one, another way the equal protection rules come into play, which um, tends not to be as well ap- appreciated. And that says, you don't sort people by race. You don't create a black district and a white district. We don't create a black drinking fountain and a a white drinking fountain. We don't create a black swimming pool and a white swimming pool. We don't create a black school and a white school. We don't create a black district and a white district. We do not sort by race. That is the equal protection clause again applied to the redistricting process. Well, hey, so what does that mean? It says, if you're going to sort by race, you, if as a state, if you're gonna do that, you better have 
a very good reason. The court, if you if it turns out that your redistricting decisions, if you took one chunk of an area and put it into a district or took it out because of race, if that was your predominant motive in doing that, I mean, we're obviously aware of race. This is politics. Of course, we know about race. You know, this group might be Democrat, Republican, whatever. You know, it's part of the equation. But if you do it because of race, if that's your predominant feature of your decision making process, then the courts. Uh, are obliged to look at that with strict scrutiny, very carefully, uh, because you are making a decision based on what is a suspect classification. Suspect classifications include race, national origin. I'm not supposed to make a Portuguese district and a an Italian district, um, you know, or I'm not supposed to make an immigrant district or a not immigrant district. Alienage. Those are all things I'm not supposed to do unless. I've got a compelling governmental interest. And what are the what compelling government interests could there be that would allow me to do to sort out by race? And that and that comes back to the 15th amendment, the other civil rights amendment that said the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So that's a big one because it turns out that you could be drawing equal districts. And if you were clever in such a way as to uh, abridge, uh, you know, make, make a black uh, area's ability to elect the candidate of their choice ineffective. And so that was recognized in the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And Section 2 of that, of that act basically elaborates on the 15th Amendment and says, we're going to look at if you if you draw district, you do if you have any practice, anything like you know, voter uh, 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 you know, literacy tests or some kind of uh, do you know, can you name all 50 counties in Georgia kind of test, you know, those kind of things. Um, if you have any of those uh, that, that that are designed to any kind of practice that's designed to reduce the ability of people to participate or to deny them the candidate of their choice, that's against the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And from a redistricting standpoint, you look at Black voters, Asian voters, Hispanic voters, Native American, Asian Pacific Islanders, Nastic, uh, um, Alaska, Alaskan, Native Alaskan voters as well as a separate category. So if you're doing your redistricting to deny any one of those particular categories a, uh, in a way to deny them the ability to vote, then you might want, if it looks like the existing districts did that, you might, you might want to, um, you have an obligation to fix that. So what would that look like? So for example, if we had a district in Boston, and Dave, do I get to run till eight? I'm I'm going to try to I'm going to try to keep be short. I'm keeping an eye on the clock though. I'm going to I'm going to finish by eight, uh, but I got there's a couple of stories left to tell here. Um, <laughs> the the um, I will be I will quit by eight. That's my pro solemn promise. Um, in Boston, let's talk about Boston. Let's talk about the Voting Rights Act in Boston and Black voters in Boston. So the biggest redistricting fight in Massachusetts history, perhaps certainly in uh, you know, my ability as a, as a, as a minor student of history to, uh, to find was in 1973. And historically in Boston, if you remember, you know, there, that's the era of busing and that's the area where the black, you know, there's, a, there's always been a significant black population in Boston, but it's the area, it's the time when the black population had grown a lot through the 40s, 50s, 60s, people are coming up from the South and by then, there were enough black voters in Boston to elect a state senator. You know, there was there was enough to to, um, you know, in Roxbury, Dorchester, to constitute the, more than half of a district and elect their own state senator. But those neighborhoods were chopped up, so they were just a small part of a bunch of other, you know, historically, uh, you know, actually Irish and Jewish senators. Um, you know, then they. they, they um, and that there was no, although there was this big black population, there was no black senator. They'd been, they'd been, as the, the word is, cracked. The vote had been cracked. So that um, there was a movement to address that. There was a, a, a progressive movement. There was a black caucus movement. 
And interestingly enough, the Republicans were on the same page. Um, and they pushed the Senate to do that, and the Senate didn't. The Senate passed a, you know, a redistricting plan that preserved all these historically sort of evolved seats. And um, the governor then vetoed it. Governor Frank Sargent vetoed it. And then something happened which never happens, which is that the House of Representatives sustained the governor's veto. The Black Caucus combined with the Progressive Caucus, combined with Republicans, uh, combined with people that were just generally uh, truculent, um, eager, to, eager, eager to, to see something different happen, uh, combined to sustain the governor's veto and force the Senate to change, to create a black district. And so that's the district that then for 30 years elected Royal Bowling, um, Mr. Owens, Bill Owens, and then um, Diane Wilkerson. And so for 30 years, you had a black senator in Boston. And then in 2000, people thought, you know, we've got enough people of color here in Boston. We think we can maybe split things up and elect two. Uh, and, and so they did, and they, so they split up the black population again. They cracked it between the first and second Suffolk district. And the short answer is it just didn't work out. Uh, you know, the, 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 the votes weren't there. And actually, you could say people of color, but actually people of color vote in different directions. They don't necessarily vote together. And the result was um, that there was not an African-American senator, senator for uh, one, uh, Diane Wilkerson lost her seat, uh, although she was definitely the black candidate of choice in that, in that race. Uh, and, um, and then we did for kind of a fluke have Linda D Dorsina Forey for a while um, in the last decade, but she won um, because the white vote was split. White vote was split in her in her primary because of a couple of different voters. So we looked at that and um, we did a lot of careful voting rights analysis. Uh, we you, you you don't you don't just do this. You don't just turn and start drawing districts based on 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 you know what color uh, the 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 folks are in in, in the neighborhoods. Um, and and we we carefully analyzed the voting right the voting results in a number of different elections. We confirmed that there were enough black voters to elect the candidate of their choice. They did have a choice in a number of particular elections. That choice was denied by the white voters around them, and that was enough of a basis to establish a voting rights act violation in our view. And on that basis, we turned to fix it and sort by race and create a black district in Boston, which now I am hopeful and it's happening is you're gonna see that black community in Boston um, engage more fully and um, have the power to elect the candidate of their choice. And there are a number of interesting candidates coming out. The other big story on the map was up in um, uh, Lawrence. In Lawrence, there's been a growing Hispanic population for many decades. Uh, and again and again, their candidates have not been able to get elected. Uh, they have they have clear candidates of choice, and the uh, surrounding white suburban communities do not vote the same way. And as a result, their candidates have not been able to get elected. There, uh, until this decade, until this time around, there was not the sufficient uh, votes to, um, they just didn't have enough of a majority, not enough citizens present to elect a candidate of their, of their choice. But this year, they crossed the line. We did a lot of careful analysis on the citizenship levels and the, um, the population levels. And we were able to determine that yes, you could construct a district which was a majority, just 50% you know, just plus one uh, of, 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 uh, of Hispanic voters in that area. And we did that. And we moved uh, a couple senators around that was pretty painful for them. Uh, but we had now created an open seat uh, that is gonna elect uh, uh, you know, the candidate of Hispanic choice, which is likely to be an Hispanic person. Uh, but that's not the way we frame it. It's not, okay, our job is not to elect a particular candidate or a particular color of candidate. Our job is to make sure the voters uh, have, their, have their ability to elect the candidate of their choice. And so we did that, I think, in two big ways in this cycle. Uh, out in Springfield, I think we had already been done. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a Puerto Rican senator from Springfield, um, and we strengthened his district, um, but basically based on traditional re redistricting principles. Once you get past the issues of that we've just discussed of equal size and of equal protection and voting rights, um, you get to the issues of keeping communities whole, preserving uh, continuity of districts, and a lot of energy gets spent at that level. But but we the, the, in terms of, of the really hard work that we did, hard analytic work, it was really 
to make sure that, to draw those new two new seats. And I think I think we're going to change the complexion and, and the and the uh, kind of conversation that happens in the Senate uh, for the for the next decade. And I'm I, I feel great about that. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for your continued work. And uh, um, it's it's amazing how often we get to see you. You're so available, and it, it's very much appreciated. I think you had office hours at five o'clock this afternoon, if I can read my Twitter feed correctly. So uh, that was Tuesday. That was Tuesday. That was Tuesday. Was well, it Tuesdays and Thursdays? I can't read the difference on the calendar. So that's, that's no, 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 no. How often you're? How often? Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we're opening up the Q&A. So um, you'll notice on the bottom of the webinar screen, there's a little, you know, little kind of bubbles there. And I think that that should be opened up pretty soon. If not, it's already open. What you need to do is simply type in a question and, and then we'll read them. And, and uh, Catherine and Priscilla will be joining us also to help field these questions. Um, when Andrea and Tanisha were talking about race and voting, it reminded me of when I was young, you know, I was in high school in 1976 with that great presidential election going on. I was, grew up in Wisconsin. Um, and I thought, well, you know, Wisconsin is a pretty progressive place, but it turns out not with respect to race. And it was during that election that I was told a statistic that stunned me then, and yet it was true and remains, you know, quite remarkable. The Voting Rights Act and the voting rights movement in the 1960s, of course, we thought a lot of the race problems have been handled by now, right? In, in 17, I'm sorry, 1876, there were more elected, black elected officials in the United States, not just at the national level, but when you look at city councils and um, state legislatures. There were more black elected officials in the United States in 1876 than there were in 1976. And the country was twice the size. Mm -hmm. And yet this is, a, this is a, a battle that we have to continue to fight. Uh, the access to the ballot box is crucially important, not just for new immigrants. It's just a little over a hundred years ago that women were able to vote. You know, political parties and candidates and campaigns are not necessarily in the democracy business. They're in the getting your number business. They have to just get more votes than somebody else. And if they can do that um, while focusing on these wells of regular voters, they'll do it. All right. I have a question now. Uh, From Gene you... Mooney. Yeah. Can the panel address the issue of how we fund the expansion of voting options and support municipalities with their mechanics of executing free and fair elections? We need to support town clerks and their staff and volunteers. Maybe I should speak to that a little bit. Um, thank you, Gene, for that question. Uh, and your your leadership in so many uh, election issues in this town is is, is is, le is a legend, and I'm grateful for all your leadership that, that's um, supported my development. Um, but the, um, and I think you have a Gene, an especial appreciation of, of the work that clerks do because you've been so close to it for so many years. Uh, I do too. Uh, I have an enormous respect for uh, our election officials, for our board of registrars, for our town clerk. And I think we've got a, a a lot of just just really great people that are incredibly committed to getting the numbers right, uh, preserving the integrity of the process, who who just take deep pride in and understand the, the critical role that they play in our democracy. And um, so, number one, I I try to listen to what uh, Ellen Ellen Cushman has to say and the registrars have to say, and make sure that we we're thinking procedurally about things that would make things easier for them. So one of the things we're doing in this Voting Rights Act bill, a vote, uh, the votes bill is that I mentioned before, is allowing them to, when the absentee ballots come in to, not absentee, but the uh, no excuse early voting ballots come in to, um, to run them through the machines and count them so that they're not, they're not stuck to trying to count all those on election day, which is, because counting is a, it's a very difficult, uh, it's actually a very difficult job. You know, they got to open the envelope and check it off and make sure they're not looking at it as it goes and so forth. So it's just a big project. So that's a big thing that we're trying to streamline for them. 
Um, and um, at every step of the way, I want to hear what they have to say. So that's that's a big part of it. Uh, and then, of course, you get into funding things for, you know, when there are special elections, special burdens that we're placing, and there's always a call for additional funding. We want to try to do that, but that's that's uh, more of a mixed picture. I have a, a slightly different answer to this. It doesn't affect Belmont per se, um, but there are uh, some jurisdictions in the country that have successfully petitioned uh, community foundations for money to help with local elections. So uh, great community foundations like in Toledo or Cleveland, for example, great community foundations there. It's, it's, it's important that we continue to fund these. Massachusetts spends a lot of money on, um, on voting, but part of it is actually in the budget for the annual um, uh, well, the annual census, Massachusetts is the only state in the country that does an annual mail-in census. Um, and that ends up at a very local level being quite expensive. So um, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm wondering if our other panelists have some input on particularly on uh, voting officials uh, and the intimidation factor and how to address that. I think that's related to some of this. Absolutely. When I think, again, you know, when in this conversation about, you know, that we're seeing now at the national level, there is a lot of focus on, um, you know, we talk about it's, a, you know, we're in a fight for our democracy, but the a lot of the attention is really only is isolated to one aspect of our democracy, and that's the voting rights and access, which as, as, as I said, it, it, is the, it is the issue writ large. But I do think it is important for us to be mindful of all of the integrated issues along the spectrum, right? And so ensuring that um, when we talk about having safe and fair, accessible elections, that absolutely includes ensuring the safety and security of those individuals who are operating our elections and ensuring that they too are safe and secure and free from intimidation. Any act against an election official um, is just as serious as any other act that is meant to suppress the vote. Uh, it is an attack on the system. I also, um, you know, I, I want to go back to this question about paying for um, uh, our elections process. Um, I do, I'm gonna, I'm always gonna go back to this point. There's, there's no greater issue facing us today than to secure our democracy. And fundamentally, the ability of every citizen across this country to be able to exercise their right to vote um, is something that we should always seek to tear down barriers for. And that includes ensuring that there is appropriate levels of funding for the process and ensuring that the way in which we are funding elections is also fair and equitable, because that too can be a barrier um, for participation. Um, and so, you know, I, I definitely, uh, you know, appreciate um, Senator uh, Brownsberger's, uh, you know, uh, response to the question and recognize how many competing interests um, our legislature here in Massachusetts has when it comes to funding. Um, but I do think that um, we need to make sure that our budget is reflecting our values. And if we say that we value um, our right to vote, then we need to make sure that there is the appropriate levels of funding um, to ensure that the process is truly free, fair, and safe. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that response. And I don't, is, I don't know if Andrea, you had any comments or? Uh, yes, I'll make a very, very quick comment. And what we're seeing in a number of states, and I just saw the bill come across my desk in Virginia, is we are now seeing bills in states that are trying to suppress the vote where they are saying that no third party money can be used for elections. And then what we also expect to see in the new Virginia budget is that 
they will have pulled out a lot of money that we need for elections in the attempt to, quote, create their self-fulfilling prophecy of, oh, elections are broken. Thank you for that. That's so sad. All right. This is a question for Tanisha and Will from Laura Caputo. Can you elaborate more about Eric and who controls how much we as a state engage with it? Will, what was the charge that you voted on? Tanisha, would you change, address the issue you raised about being part of Eric, but not making the most of it? I'll let uh, Senator Brownsberger go first since he is in, you, do you want to answer <laughs> first or would you like for me? Sure, sure. So um, basically what we did was require the Secretary of State to enter into an agreement with Eric uh, and begin fully using Eric in, in, by a certain date, which was later this year. Um, it may end up being a later date when we finally get the bill across the finish line. Uh, but basically start using Eric to compare our list of voters with the list of voters in other states uh, and identify voters who have moved. So you clean up the rolls and also identify voters who have maybe moved in but have not registered so that they can be, you know, reach uh, uh, somehow someone can reach out to them and uh, cause them to be registered. So I think what's in, one of the things that's important to note is that when um, Eric was signed into law in 2018 by Governor Baker, it was signed into law with no, um, there was no deadline for our participation. Okay, so one of the things, um, you know, that we definitely need to make sure, you know, as the House and the Senate uh, go through their process and mix it up, um, we do need to make sure that um, that 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 the deadline uh, that 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 there is a deadline for our full participation in Eric, um, and that is part of. Um, the legislative package that is currently moving um, through the legislative process. That is critically important. With no deadline, you know, we can have incremental steps. Um, with a deadline, it does cause us to act with a sense of urgency. Um, would I, I, I'm going to just want to make sure that I'm understanding the question. And so if the question is, would do I support our participation in Eric? Absolutely. I want to say, you know, that the NAACP um, is a full supporter of what is what is known as the Votes Act. Um, here uh, in Massachusetts, our statewide um, uh, coalition of NAACP branches has endorsed the Votes Act, which is in, which includes. Um, certainly the full implementation of ERIC by a set deadline. Um, so yes, we do support it as, as presented. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, the next is just a comment from Bob McGaw. It will be very important for all registered voters to vote. For Democrats, it will be very, very important for all registered Democrats to vote, regardless of what the laws are. Voter turnout is critical. Stacey Abrams understands this better than anyone. So that's from Bob McGaw. And Jean, McCooney, Jean Mooney says we should clarify ERIC stands for Electronic Registration Information Center for those who might not know what ERIC is. Uh, and I also wanted to uh, welcome, I see that DA Marion Ryan is also one of the participants here with tonight. So DA Ryan, welcome. Welcome. Um, May I make a comment on uh, something that Tanisha mentioned a moment ago um, that she, she said that how we spend our money should reflect our values. And I think the sad reality is that how we spend our money does reflect the values of much of this country, much of the state. If we could spend uh, as much money as we do on those sound barriers along highways that protect people who have their don't like their backyard barbecue being invaded. Even when they bought the house, they knew that there was a highway there. We spend so much money on sound barriers as opposed to sound election administration. And um, the, the, the real tragedy is that our values are misaligned and our democracy is in peril because of it. So let's focus on those values and helping other people understand the deeply seated values. Um, Priscilla or 
Catherine, I know there's another question up. Um, it's actually just a comment. Priscilla, did you want to read this comment? Sure. It's anonymous attendee. Um, the comment is, and there needs to be support for voters who want to speak in public hearings. Um, yet you, Senator Brandsberger, had a public hearing today on the correctional funding and didn't allow voters to speak at this public hearing. Do you want to Response yeah, no, look, it, that, that was not a public hearing. That was a that was a meeting of the commission. Uh, we, we had a public hearing the week before. But if there's something that uh, that somebody felt was excluded, um, my cell phone number is 617-771-8274. <laughs> and I'll put that in the chat and I'm easy to reach. Thank you. One of the questions we get. I'm going to put my cell, cell phone in the chat right now. Seven, seven. OK, thank you. Everyone that's else has so it well. Beloved. Yeah. That's why Senator Brownsburg is so beloved. And that's right. So accessible. And, and he answers his phone. That's what's so amazing. One of the questions we get as an organization here in the suburbs, uh, in a pre predominantly white suburb, uh, is you know, ways in which we can uh, partner, which we have with Reclaim Our Vote, but way in which, not, I don't like to, to use the word partner, I'd like to say follow and support the leadership in communities of color to help with uh, issues on voting. So I wondered if, if Andrea and Tanisha could, could, could uh, talk a little bit about ways in which we might uh, support your work? When we first got started doing this um, in 2017 in Alabama, we got a lot of questions from our phone bankers. How would Southern, and we were calling the Alabama Black Belt, how would people respond to the Obviously, we're not from Alabama, and we're probably not Black either. And so I gave the example, uh, there's a dance in the community. Everybody knows when the dance is. Everybody knows where the dance is. Some people feel they're not welcome, so they don't come. So what I always explain to my volunteers is you are inviting people to participate in the dance of democracy. Thank you. Oh, absolutely beautiful. <laughs> I, I am, um, I, I do want to go back to uh, something I shared, I mentioned, made reference to earlier, you know, again, we are, so many of us are struck by what's happening outside of Massachusetts. And we have, I mean, Massachusetts showed, has shown up uh, in other states um, over the last, specifically over the last uh, two years um, on these issues relative to voting rights and access. We have, we have been on the ground um, in many of these other states. And I, and I do think that's important because what happens to one of us happens to all of us, okay? And so, being um, intentional about helping our neighbors in other states protect and defend is important. Uh, that said, I believe it's equally as important uh, for us to do the work in our own backyard. Um, and so, what I, I when I'm asked this question, um, you know, um, from our um, our neighbors, our allies, our friends, um, whether it's on issues of education, economic opportunity, climate housing or voting rights they say people will say what can we do to help um my response is the first thing you can do to help is to work your local community work in your work in your own backyard ensure that your city your town your neighborhood um, is doing all it can to reflect the values um, that you um, are trying to uphold and fulfill because when you secure home base, when you're taking yes. care of your own backyard, then you are better positioned um, to help others. So I believe, I believe um, it, it is important for us to do that. Secondly, uh, third, and third, I will say that, you know, there are, we're very fortunate across um, Massachusetts to have just a vibrant nonprofit and advocacy community. There's an issue, 
there's an organization. <laughs> okay. And so I d also encourage um, folks to look for um, you know organizations on this particular issue like Mass Vote, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> organizations like Common Cause, organizations um, like the ACLU of Massachusetts, organizations like Lawyers for Civil Rights, and also the NAACP. Um, the NAACP is all volunteer um, led driven. The, the, the other organizations I mentioned are, you know, they have full time staffs, everybody gets paid to show up every day. Um, the NAACP, we are volunteer um, grassroots. Um, but what's great about the NAACP in comparison to the others is that we do have local branches. And so I do encourage folks to seek out, if you're so inclined, your local branch of the NAACP um, to get involved um, and to provide support. When, when we were working in Georgia, Tanish, uh, we were partnered with the Atlanta NAACP and they partnered with all the branches that were out in the Black Belt. Mm -hmm. So whenever we can, because our organization was born virtual, uh, most of my volunteers are in very, very blue states. They're in California and Oregon and Washington State. They're in New York. They're in Connecticut. Um, and so, yes. But what we have done is when Connecticut needed assistance in advocating for um, permanent early voting and permanent vote by mail, because Connecticut had assisted us we built the texting program and the advocacy tools for Connecticut to advocate because we have tools that allow us to see every bill introduced in Congress and every state legislature. And then we can basically quickly write those alerts. So for our partners that that help us, it's a two-way street. Absolutely. We will be there. Absolutely. Andrea, for um, we were so in Belmont, so um, grateful to be able to work with Reclaim Our Vote and to be able to write postcards. And um, it was just such a well-organized and amazing organization and campaign. And I know that you've done work in documenting that the postcards have an impact. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that, how you measure that impact. It's um, easy for us to measure the impact um, in some states on some things easier than others because the state just has better reporting systems. So the very first time we ever did postcards was in North Carolina in 2019. We had never, ever done it before. And so um, in one county, uh, we can isolate it because no one else was working in that county. Onslow County, North Carolina. And in Onslow County, we sent um, 309 postcards. In those days, we only sent postcards to people where we had a bad phone number. Out of those 309 postcards, 85 people re-registered to vote. Now, because we're a lot bigger, we when we postcarded Georgia and there were 1.8 million voters of color, we sent a postcard to all 1.8 million voters. <laughs> So we weren't quite certain, was it us? Was it somebody else? We don't know. We can see who got registered, but we don't have that lovely control group that we had in North Carolina where there was nobody there but us. Thank you.
May I? I actually, I, I would like to um, just go back to something that uh, Senator Brownsberger uh, said. Uh, but before I do, um, you know, just want to certainly lift up the work, Andrea, um, that you've done. And I think it, it is it is on that last note. Um, I do think it's important to note that this work is not a solo journey. And so any, right, and so the collaboration and the coordinated efforts that we have with other organizations on the ground, when there is a win for our democracy, you know, um, that is our collective win. Yes. Okay. Um, but I do want to thank uh, Senator Brownsberger um, for the work that he did with redistricting. Um, you know, there, there, he gave a snapshot. Um, there were, through this last redistricting process, um, certainly on the Senate side and in and, and the House side, um, we did see um, progress toward breaking down structural barriers to representation. Um, the reality of the situation is that for too many years, you know, we had, um, you know, uh, Senator Sonia Chang Diaz was the lone senator of color in our state Senate. Um, and, you know, up until the time when Senator Gomez was elected um, and took office in 2020. Um, and so as a, as, a, um, as a state that certain, again, most of us, um, you know, um, really do talk about inclusion and really do want to have greater inclusion in our government um, and in our, our elected offices, what we were reflecting was not um, was not a represent representative um, government, and so the work that was done by the redistricting committee um, this last cycle um, to again kind of break down what were what have been barriers to greater representation or or more reflective representation is not insignificant, and so while the focus. Um, was um, that, that um, Senator Brownsberger lifted up was on Boston um, in, in north of um, Boston, the, the Haverhill area, where you know, we will potentially see greater representation across the ideological spectrum, across the racial and, across racial and ethnic groups, hopefully more women. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Um, you, know, um, uh, you know, down in my hometown in Brockton, out in Central Mass and Worcester, and hopefully, you know, again, greater representation or greater opportunity um, for um, a representation that is more reflective um, of of of, uh, of our of the Commonwealth and of the type of um, legislature that we want to see. So I do want to thank Senator Brownsberger for that work. Thank you all. I, I know that we do have another question pending, but we are up against a deadline. And that deadline is for us to go on our way and continue to do the good work, whether in Massachusetts or nationally or very locally. Thank you to the participants and now Please say hello to Priscilla, who will take us home and close us out. Thank you, David, for excellent moderating. And thanks so much to the panelists, to Andrea Miller and Tanisha Sullivan and Senator Brownsberger. It's been a really wonderful discussion and presentations. Um, and we just want to close by encouraging people to be in touch, people listening um, or on the webinar or on the television station, just to let you know that um, if you would like to get involved in some of the ways that Andrea and Tanisha have talked about um, to advocate or to send postcards, um, you can get in touch by um, emailing um, Belmont Against Racism or fcbuuthevote at gmail.com. And Catherine and I will respond and um, let people know how they can how they can be involved in this such important issue. So thanks to all for joining tonight. Yes, thank you and very thank much. Especially to the panelists and to Excellent. Um, Belmont Media and uh, Catherine and David as well. Yeah. David. Thank, thank you, you again David. to the organizers. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And it was wonderful meeting all the other panelists. This was a wonderful way to spend an evening. Thank you so, <laughs> so much, much for being with us. Thank you all. This is wonderful.